Welcome to the Get Boss Podcast, where musicians go to learn how to navigate the new music economy. My name is Adam Meckler, and it's my mission to get you the tools to have a thriving career in music. And we do that by giving you interviews with rad artists, and I just kind of give you everything I've learned in my professional career as well. And I'm continuing to learn as I talk to these amazing artists. Today, the artist I'm going to talk to is Ian Allison. Ian Allison is a bass player, content creator, music director. He is the music director for and bass player for Eric. Hutchinson, who has a gold record. They just released a new record called Sing Along, uh, which is really fun. And Ian talks a lot about being a content creator for Scott's Bass Lessons. Scott's Bass Lessons has over a million subscribers on YouTube. And he specifically talks about finding a way to make content that is unique to you and that is true to yourself in a really cool, interesting way. I'm not going to tell you what he says because it's really awesome. You'll have to listen to check that out. And we also have a really awesome uh, thing to announce with Gig Boss. I'm wearing my Gig Boss t-shirt. Here at Gig Boss, we have an app that's an organizational tool for freelance musicians. You may know about it. It's free on iOS and Android. You can download it and you can kind of use it to help schedule uh, bands and other people you play with and kind of track finances. We're adding more features to that. If you're using it already, shoot me an email, adam at gigbossapp.com and just be like, hey man, it would be awesome if we had XYZ in the app because we're adding new features right now. It's just going to keep getting better. It totally works. It's valuable. Check it out. But the, the cool announcement we have is that we're, we're partnering with Ari Herstand, the author of How to Make It in the New Music Business. So Ari is a total mover and shaker. He's totally kicking butt. He's like the music business guy uh, in LA right now. And he's a young cat. He's like my age, originally from Minneapolis, moved to LA a long time ago. He wrote that book, that award-winning book, and now he has online courses that are taught by leaders in the industry, not all taught by himself. Some of them are, some of them aren't. But he's he's enlists the leaders in each industry. So there's a class you can take on how music how to navigate TikTok as as a musician or how to do Instagram and Facebook ads as a musician. There's that's run by this guy Ludicious who has you know 200 million streams on, streams on Spotify and he's done it all through ad placements on Instagram and not through editorial playlist placements. Okay, so that's really an important detail. No editorial placements. He's got 200 million streams. He's the one who teaches that course. There's a class on sync licensing where they actually hook you up with licensing uh, companies, databases at the end of the class that you can build relationships with. Um, also taught by leaders in the sync industry. So this is a really awesome thing that he's got going and we've created a deal with them. You can go to there, you can click the link in our description and you can go to Ari's Take Academy and check out what courses are offered. If you purchase a course, you can type in the code GIGBOSS right here on my t-shirt, G-I-G-B-O-S-S, GIGBOSS, and you get 10% off whatever class you decide to take. And that really helps us out. That's a way for us to start to grow our show and also these are great great things for all musicians i've attended a bunch of ari's webinars they're super awesome so check that out when you get a chance i'm just pumped i'm just pumped to bring you this interview with ian ian is so great he's he's an infectious personality a really he's really like a spirited human right he's really fun to hear talk about uh all of his anecdotes surrounding being a music director surrounding being a bass player and a musician a recording artist he does a lot of studio work he's got some really fascinating experiences in the studio realm and i just think you're all going to get so much out of his talk uh, i got to meet ian playing with nookie jones nookie jones was one of the neo soul bands that i helped start and he played bass with that for a little while and so you can hear my opening question we talk a little bit about our experience working together in Nookie Jones. So here we go. Without further ado, Ian Allison. One of the things that really struck me when we first met was your energy. You came on board like the Nookie Jones train for a little while and subbed on some gigs and some smaller little tour runs. Um, I remember that you had an insanely positive and supportive vibe and that you knew all the tunes like you'd been playing in the band all along. But dude, that you had made the parts your own in interesting and tasteful ways. And I, I'd love to hear how you begin to form your ideas when you're presented with new music from a new artist and how you decide like what effects to use, how much or how little to play and things like that. Dude, what a lovely question. Thanks. Um, thanks for having me, man. I, 
I took that gig, that Nookie Jones gig, really seriously because it because you guys did. And whenever I come into a camp, I try to take it really seriously. But that was heavy. I mean, there was rehearsals. You know, uh, Kevin Gastongue is looking at me like I play one little thing that's a little loud, and he he hears it. Like everybody hears it, right? I mean, everyone in that band has the biggest ears, so it felt like I needed to really be on my game. Um, and even though I had some charts, I was trying to be as memorized as I could. Yep. Be- before I tell you about process and all that, l- l- let me first just tell you this. The first gig I played with you guys, I was so nervous. It was at an outdoor festival thing, like maybe Sociable Cider Works or something. Yeah. Yep. And all in black, you know, everybody's rocking the suits, looking sharp, you know. And I had some pants. Maybe, you know, your boy maybe had been eating too many cheeseburgers, you know, <laughs> for, for the few months before. I was up a little bit, you know. And, uh, and I remember taking a big step, dude, onto stage and my pants just ripped. I'm That's talking, right. I'm talking like <laughs> all the way around one of the back thighs, my right <laughs> back thigh, <laughs> just completely ripped. And I was like, oh my God, dude, it was hot outside. And yep. I've got like tape. I'm, I'm trying to gaff it closed, not happening. And I'll never forget, I just like took my bass, lowered the strap a little bit. So now we're more like uh, rock and roll height as opposed yep. to like jazz nerd height. Like flea. Just drop it down. <laughs> yeah, dude. Just dropped it down and just played the show and just made sure not to turn around. Um, and and actually, it was amazing because it. I was like, well, like nothing else is going to be worse than this. Yeah. Like, like even if I play a hundred wrong notes, like nothing will be worse than my butt hanging out of my pants so it's all good. So the it actually, nightmare like, calms of losing me your down. pants. <laughs> yeah. So I would say to anybody listening, like one of the best things you can do before getting on stage and being really nervous to play with a band is just split the ass of your pants wide open and it will help calm you down. Great um, idea. Great idea. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, but I mean, you know, in terms of process, I just try to learn the material. Um, obviously, your guys' the bass player, shout out to Andrew Foreman, killing bass player, wrote all these great lines. And what I try to do when I learn a song or a body of work is I just try to really identify the things that are signature and the things that need to be played. So if there's a bass line that's an ostinato that's repeating that feels like a sub hook, of course I'm going to learn that. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, maybe passing tones, if it's a chord based tune and it's an eighth note thing, um, I'm not going to capture every single passing note. I sort of think that that maybe is left up to the individual bass player. Maybe that's the art. Maybe that's what gives you sound. And then, man, then I always try to bring a little piece of me to a gig, no matter what the gig is. I try to, um, like, if I hear something, meaning like in my head, I'm listening and I think, oh, this moment would be so heavy to like kick on an octave pedal and play that unison line with the horns with that sub octave. Yeah. That's that's what I, I mean, I love that stuff. I really love electronic music. I really love funk music, key bass. And so sometimes I think in that space a lot. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm not trying to shoehorn it in where it doesn't work. It, like the great Michael League from Snarky Puppy has this great quote where he says, I only step on a pedal if it would be musically irresponsible not to do so. <laughs> and I love that. I love yeah. that idea where it's like, oh, here comes this moment and it needs more like needs something from the bottom. Yeah. And so like it would be, you know, I've got these boxes. I love this stuff, right? So it would be really silly if I didn't step on a fuzz or step on an octave pedal to really make this next section punch. So I'm trying to follow my instincts in that way and then really honor the tunes by playing the things that are signature. Cool, cool. So do you do any like digging into other thing like do you do you ever go like this band does this style of music so i'm going to dig into that style of music like you're checking out other bands recordings as well when you're like maybe early on when you were starting to do this kind of work um were you were you also kind of referencing outside material when you were joining a band yeah definitely i i will say that for me is less of like a band pursuit and more of a studio pursuit yeah so when someone sends me something to play on like i do a bunch of tracking from home and i I do stuff in studios as well but if i'm coming in to a camp i don't maybe know the producer very well or uh, and maybe even um you know i don't exactly know what the artist likes I, i really think it's important to find out what the artist 
likes. Yeah. Even I think that's even sometimes more important than like specific sonic references, unless there's a target. Like I work for a, a great producer named Joey Verscazzi who always sends me like very defined targets. Hmm. Like I want you to go for the sound on, you know, this Portugal the Man tune or go for the sound on this like particular track of Frank Ocean, like very specific references. And then of course, I mean, that's like easy, right? I mean, that's falling off the vine. So I check that stuff out, absolutely. But like, for instance, when I joined Eric Hutchinson's band about seven years ago, yep. and he he was such an enigma to me because the stuff that he liked, I didn't necessarily connect to his music. Hmm. I was having a hard time. He would say like, I want it to be reggae. But to me, like what I discovered is he didn't necessarily want it to be like old school, like Bob Marley reggae. He wanted it to be more like a sublime vibe or sure, something, right? Sure. Like, And he, he is absolutely in love with Elvis Costello. And so I did a big deep dive. He actually gave me a huge playlist, which was such a gift of all these Elvis Costello tunes. And so I really dug in hard to that. So for me, I want to have similar references of what the artist loves. Not to say that I necessarily have to build a love for the same stuff, but I want to know it. So when he's like, oh, you know, like the watching the detectives thing or make some kind of Costello reference, I know what that is. And I've put enough time into understanding how to do the like that style of playing. Yeah. Yeah. I actually love the idea of being influenced by a style, but not having it sound overt in your music as well. Yeah. I mean, I think there's so many nuances to, you know, it's like the reggae style. It's like, you know, really trying to do that the way the Bob Marley, it's like, there's a, that's a really deep and specific language. Yes. And so it's like, if you're going to do it all the way, it's like, you got to do it all the way. Uh, but and letting those little yeah. little nuances kind of creep into whatever you do, I think, is what really makes the special sauce of uniqueness for an artist, you know? Yes, dude. And I think that, like, doing it your way is the only way that you can do it, actually. I mean, yeah, you have, you know, go back and learn from the masters and all that. But if I were playing in a punk rock band, I wouldn't try to fool them that I only came up listening to the Ramones and the Clash. Or if I was going to do sub a gig with like an Afro-Cuban band, I, I, they, they would know immediately. There would be no fooling, yeah. right? So I would try to do my best to honor the music, but I wouldn't try to veil it and like, oh yeah, I've I've studied this music. I, you know, I was born with La Lengua. Like, no. Sure. Uh -huh. like, <laughs> like, no. Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. I, I think bringing yourself to it is, I think as long as you're doing it tastefully and not trying to do it out of ego, like, oh, I have to bring my thing and, and put my stamp on it. Yeah. Um, I think a, a little awareness around that is actually a, a really good thing. Yeah. One of the themes of this podcast is, well, at least in my um, more recent conversations, has been uh serving the song you know yeah man hearing the song and serving the song be, having that be your number one priority and kind of leaving your ego at the door in that way um and that, yeah i feel like you really embody that in a, in a deep big way oh uh, thanks man uh, yeah I, dude. I think about it a lot i think about it a lot i think it's incredibly important um i think you know if i if i'm thinking about the cool thing that i want to play it's the wrong it's automatically the wrong thing yeah um, like if i'm like oh what cool thing can i oh like i've lost i've just lost it's like, okay, start from scratch. Yep. Um, I, I don't know about you, man. I, I would actually love to hear how you do this too, but I get tracks a lot from people that just don't have anything. It'll be chords, they'll be, and no scratch. Sometimes people send scratch and I love that because you know, if, if someone sends me a scratch baseline, mm -hmm. I typically think they like it. And then I glean a lot from that. But a lot of times I get nothing. And I don't know about you, but what I have found so much success with is I put my freaking bass down on my lap mm. and I close my eyes and I listen to the song and I sing the bass line that I yeah, wish man. existed. Like that's it. Yeah, right? man. Because then you're not then you're not going through all the tropes of your instrument. You're, totally. right? you're, you're not you're not fingering the valves. That's yep. probably not the way you say that, right? <laughs> that's <laughs> right. That's right. Actually, it sounds dirty, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, you, right. You're not going through the shapes that you associate with your instrument. Like I'm not playing the stupid, you know, pentatonic licks that I always play. If I put the instrument down, I close my eyes, and I just imagine like what would I want to exist there, or mm -hmm. or like I maybe try to get in some 
somebody's shoes. Like, what would Pino do there? What would Tony Levin do there? What would, you know, if if so-and-so were hired to do this, what would they do? And sometimes that gives me vision. And I'm mm. never going to sound like Pino or Tony, right? So it's like that helps me find the thing. And almost always there's a melody that comes to me immediately Yeah, that I think... Honestly, I just think of bass lines as melodies. Yep, it's just melodies yeah. played down low. But I mean, bass lines and horn parts are the same. They're yeah. just like they're just like ar- arranged in a different part of the band, I think, you know. Sure. Um and so I'll sing something and then I'll try to then maybe craft it. Does it need to support a little more? Does it need to land on some, some root motion a little more? How can it better support the song? But if it comes from a singing example for me, then it's not like I'm just wanking and playing stupid licks yeah totally man I, I feel that and i like to write that way when i'm composing i write that way where i'm like i'll come up with a chord progression and then i'll just sing rather yeah. than take my horn out it's like singing allows me it's like then i'm only gonna write what i hear yes. rather than you know rather than falling as you say on the things that you've worked out you know it's like you go yeah. on autopilot um right. i hear recordings of myself where i'm like ah oh, man it's the same shit i gotta yes. get out of right. my Got to get out of my, you know, Yeah, I always do and get into something new. Dude, check this out. I just had a, a conversation. This is going to sound like such a name drop, and I, I guess it is, but it's true. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm doing a bunch of work for SBL now. That's Scott's Bass Lessons, and I get to yep. interview all these players, and it's been unbelievable. And I just did an interview with Oteil Burbridge, the yep. great Oteil Burbridge, who played in the Aquarium Rescue Unit and then, um, of course, played with the Almond Brothers and played with Tedeschi Trucks and is now with Dead & Company. Wow. But he said this thing yesterday that it was so cool. He said that like he he does a lot of singing while he plays. He was known, he's a bass player that plays a six string um, and he he's known for like singing his solos simultaneously, like a George Benson thing. So you're like sort of scatting along with what he's playing, right? Yep. And he said this thing of when he feels nervous or when he feels like he's on a big stage at Red Rocks, you know, all these people and he feels super nervous and he's about to get into his solo and there's something that's just, you know, maybe the sound is weird. Uh, there's something that's blocking his creativity. He says he plays one note and holds the note for a long time and sings that note. So he'll go um, and let the let the groove go by and hang on to one note. And he said when he does that, it might be a bar, two bars, four bars, but the time passes. He said, what happens is it's like the matrix. Everything slows down like, (laughs) and then all of a sudden he's in this zone. He's like in more of a flow state. Yeah. He he comes out blazing. If he's like, like he runs out of gas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that if he plays one note and sings it and closes his eyes and sings that note, that then he then inevitably he thinks of another thing to play. Yeah. Right. Instead of just blowing out of the gate. Yeah. And I thought that, dude, I'd never heard anybody say that before. And it was really like I need to try that. Totally. <laughs> the next time I'm afforded the opportunity of of taking a bass solo, which in my world is sort of rare. But <laughs> uh it's it, but it was really cool. It was actually really inspiring. Yeah, I love that idea. And you sort of mentioned that there's this book by Kenny Werner called Effortless Mastery, where he mm-hmm. talks about uh, anytime you try to be, you mentioned earlier a little bit, like you try to be cool or, and, and like coming out blazing is, is one of those things. It's like, I'm, I'm coming out to be, here's all yeah. my stuff. Yeah. Um, and like a lot of times when you do that, you end up not liking what you play. And, and Kenny Werner's book, he talks a lot about, um, he talks a lot about like getting in the zone, flow state playing and not worrying who's in the room, not worrying about being cool. It's like every time you're trying to be cool, you you aren't. And every time you don't care, you play the best stuff. Yeah. Um, and so getting into this place where, you, where you're not caring who's in the room, where you're not caring about where, where the, the main priority is music making rather than yeah. ego, ego playing. You know what I mean? Big. Um, yeah, big, man. Uh, it's something that definitely resonates with me uh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, and O'Teal said this thing too of, you know, his time in the AR, you <laughs> making this about O'Teal Burbridge, but it was incredible. He said, he said, you have to embrace the mirror of embarrassment. And I mm. thought, oh dear God. And that's most people are not willing to do that. Right. You have to highlight your uh, deficiencies. You have to get so comfortable that if you blow it, you squeak, you miss a thing, you d- that, that it doesn't tank you. 
Yeah. Um, and, and that's that something yeah, applies that's to hard. practicing too, right? I mean, that's of course. That, there's a certain level of like know what you're bad at, so that you're practicing those things and not the yes. things that you're good at. This is very yes. easy to stroke your own oh, ego sure. practicing, right? Because it just feels so good to play the things that you're good at. Yeah. You're like, oh, yes, well, this, you know, you're patting yourself on the back. But yeah, if you're if you're really looking in the mirror, because we all have things that are beautiful and we all have things that are ugly. Mm -hmm. Right. And like if you if you can really see those ugly things and be like, yep, all good. I'm going to embrace that. I'm going to work on that, whatever that is. Right. Like not trying to hide it. I think that's like Otil's thing was like not trying to hide the things that you're bad at and actually like lean into them even uh -huh. on the bandstand. And that it was, it was a heavy thought. It was a heavy thought. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> wild. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I heard you tell this story. I think you told this to me when we were in a van. Um, but I, then I, I watched an interview that you did recently prepping for this. And I heard you tell the story about getting fired from your first oh, session. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know how he was asking for i think he asked for a mccartney thing can, can you tell that story is there anything that you learned in particular like what did you learn from that situation that's early was, early in your career right yeah it was huge i mean real briefly i came up like a rock and roll dude in an original band like my first music experiences i mean i played in jazz band and i played in orchestra i was really bad at the upright so i had some like academic school music experiences but what really fed me so I was in a rock band with my friends from early teens. Like I was 13 and I was in a band, right? So everything was about this band. And then when I had some other opportunities, like I, I got to be a decent enough bass player that I could play other things and other gigs. And I had an opportunity to make a record in a studio working with a, a great producer named Matt Kirkwald, who's here in Minneapolis. And, uh, and man, you know, Matt was like, I remember I brought, I had like, he was like, oh, bring a P bass. But the only P bass I had was this Yamaha Billy Sheehan attitude bass, you know? Ooh, so I brought that and, you know, and I was even kind of self-aware of that at the time. But, you know, I, I remember him saying like, hey, for this tune, like a few songs went well. It was like, for this tune, let's do like a McCartney thing in the bridge. And if I'm honest, like I, I was like, I was thinking, I think maybe he means the Beatles like is Paul, I mean, really, like I have that level, low level of knowledge, like my parents like the Beatles. But at that time for me, if I'm just being very honest, yep. in my in my mid 20s, the Beatles were like my parents music. They played them at the Dairy Queen. Sure. Like, like not cool to me. I would hear the, the White Album and it sounded like a circus and not like and it. I just didn't understand it. I was like, is someone going to say like, ha ha. Like it felt like the, a joke was being played on me. Like I hear Rocky raccoon. And I'm like, what is happening? Yeah, right? man. And I just wasn't, I wasn't into the catalog. Right. I didn't know the catalog. I didn't know the reference. So I was like, I think he means Beatles. I think he means Beatles. Paul McCartney played up high. I think, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so I just like went up high and played a bunch of stuff. And he was like, do you know, he like stopped it. And was like, do you, do you know what I'm saying? Paul McCartney, the Beatles. I'm like, of course, yes, of course. And I lied, you know, because oh, you're scared. You're trying to fool somebody, right? It goes back to that thing we were just talking about. Like, right. you're going to fool, you're trying to fool somebody. I wasn't fooling this dude. Played it again, played some just bullshit. And he was like, all right. And he said, here's the deal. We're going to be done. And I want you to go and get two things. I want you to go to Cheapo and get Beatles number ones and, um, and like a Motown, like Hitsville, USA, a Motown box set. Yep, and I want you to devour Paul McCartney's bass playing, like learn 10 Beatles songs and learn 10 Motown tunes, James Jamerson. And I yep. was like, okay, okay, I I'll do that. And I was like, I'll, okay, I, I can even do that like after the session. And he's like, well, this, this is after the session because we're done. We're and I'm like, done. You know, and, and there was still like half the record to make, you know? Yep. And I was like, oh, and he was like, yeah, it it's all good. He's like, just, you know, do that stuff and, and let me know after you've done it. And yeah. I said, okay. And dude, I packed up, walked out to my car, loaded into my car and wept. Wow. I cried, dude. Wow. I was just like, oh. I mean, it was so painful because I knew he was right. Yeah. He was yep. right. You know? And then yeah. I will say, I mean, I did that work. I did it. I went out and got like wiped the tears and the, like a snot away from my face, you know, and like went in and bought that stuff and learned it. And then we ended up doing more work together. And, you know, it was just the beginning of this thing for me yeah. of like going out of my comfort zone, becoming a more well-rounded player versus then just the like meat fisted rock dude yep. in my band. 
You know, it was really yeah. critical. And it was actually like, he could have just, he could have said, ah, you know, it's not quite the right vibe, you know, or, or he could have let me kind of finish it and then not use me and then never tell me why. Never and I call would you again. Why? Yeah. Yep. But yep. instead, he really gave me a gift. You yeah, know, that's a gift, like, man. Totally. Yeah, it is, right? Like yeah. somebody saying to you, you're not cutting it. Here's why. Here what you can, here's what you can do to fix it. Yep. That's a gift. So I'm really grateful. I actually was hanging with Matt on a session about a month ago and told that story. And he was like, did I really? And he'd sort of forgotten. I was like, no, dude, it was like, it was over. It was over. Yeah. I went to the car and I cried. He's like, I'm so sorry. I'm like, don't be it like, it changed my life. Like, it's amazing. Yeah. You know, it was just great. Yeah. That's such a valuable experience. And it's hard to see that. I think when, when you're young, uh, you have an experience like that, it's easy to feel really defeated. And I think yes. it's, it's hard to see the big picture. You know what I mean? Yes. When you're young and that, that's such a cool, uh, I had, you know, I had a similar experience playing. There's this Roy Hart. This is just a handful of years ago. Uh, when Roy Hargrove passed, there was a tribute show for him at, at the Dakota. And I was one of the trumpet players that was asked to play. And Justin Robinson, who toured with Roy Hargrove for a long time in his quintet, um, was our guest, you know, and I got to play like standing next to Justin and, you know, we played this tune that was really complicated and I worked super hard on it. And it was like complicated in terms of the form. And yeah. in the rehearsal, it was clear that like we weren't quite making it, but it was, it had this real, it had this energy that was really pure and cool. And so we were like, we're going to do it anyway. And I played my solo. We stepped off the stage and Justin pulled me aside and he was like, Hey man, you're trying to play the tune the way you want to play it. And everybody else is playing it another way. It's like mm -hmm. you need to let go of what you whatever you worked on let go of that and mm -hmm. live in the moment during the song and play oh, with wow. the band rather than trying to force the changes in the spots you know what i mean and yes. it was like i was i was in the and i was mature enough and this was only a ha few years ago five yeah. maybe four or five years ago yes i was mature enough to go like thank you for saying that like i i could see i i knew as soon as he said it it was like yeah that's that's exactly what I was feeling on stage, yes. you know, um, and had that Dude. lesson to go. Just let go. Just flow. And it's different, you know, when you're playing like modern, crazy jazz music versus songs in the traditional sense. But um, I think similar too, in, in that it's like you're there, you're in the moment, you're serving the song, you're serving the song in the moment that you're in uh, rather than trying to force something into it. Oh, you know? yeah. And I mean, it takes so much effort and vulnerability actually for somebody to like him saying that to you means he cares like yeah. if he just thought you were like ah this this dude doesn't get it he would never say that to you because it's not worth it it's right. not worth to uh, create potentially awkward situation right but he saw something in you he he must have really loved your playing and or and loved something about you that he would actually take the time and energy to bring up that potentially awkward thing like that's i think that's actually a big big deal versus totally. somebody just being like ah whatever yeah I'm good. you know yeah and all along i felt like i'd rather somebody tell me i'd rather know of you know course. like be blunt be honest and that's hard in the midwest me. we're used to people really sugarcoating things and it's are. like just tell me you know tell me um, yes. and the people that are i think the heavier players it's like that's just how they all operate because that's how you that's how you get the best product that's how you get the best music it's like it's no reason beating around the bush but we're all here together to make the best music you know I got a chance to sub for um, Soul Asylum on a little run and the great Michael Bland. I know, you know, yeah. Michael Bland, anybody listening who doesn't know Michael was in Prince's New Power Generation in the early 90s, uh, like Minneapolis and worldwide drum um, legacy. He, he's oh. an incredible drummer, perfect pitch, amazing MD, some of the biggest ears uh, that I have ever experienced. And when I was doing that gig. I will never forget, there was a moment where we were playing a tune, and I mean, I learned those parts because I was going to be with Michael. I played with Michael a lot. I knew what he was going to expect. He was not going to let me get away with anything. Oh. And yet, there was still a tune where I was I was playing, you know, it was just something that was going boom, 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 like gumming from a G to a C or, you know, whatever, a one to a four, mm -hmm. right? And I remember playing boom, 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 boom. And he was like, oh, hold up. He was like, what are you doing there? And I was like, what? The, the G to C thing? And he's like, yeah. He's like, I hear you, man. You're getting to it through a B. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, the record's a D, man. He approaches it from the top. 
I was like, oh, like, boo doo 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 yeah. Oh, and he was like, yeah, yeah, that you need to do that. And I was like, <gasps> and, and I thought to myself, wow. I mean, I think I even said something at the beginning of this of like, sometimes those passing tones are sort of like up for grabs. Yeah. Yeah. But in Michael's world, no way. Right. That was not up for grabs, at least on the soul asylum gig. He really wanted me to adhere to those parts. And that meant even the way that Carl, the original bass player moved between those chord tones. Right. And, and that was so cool to me, actually. He could have let that go. Yeah. But he shut the rehearsal down to be like, hold up. Like, you need to get with the tapes, man. <laughs> yeah, get with the tapes. Get with the tapes. Get with the tapes. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I, I think that's such a cool thing, too, when you finally play with somebody that that hears everything. And you have a moment like that where you realize they're going to hear everything I play for the rest yes. of the thing. You know what I mean? It's like they're hearing everything. I, like, there's a dude in Youngblood who's like that, Nat McIntosh, who like wrote all that Youngblood brass band music. And mm -hmm. I remember putting in, I put in like a, a harmony note in one of the parts because it felt open and thin to me. And I was just like, eh, I'm just going to throw this brass band music, whatever. And it's like, he wrote all that stuff. And he stopped the same thing, stopped the band. He was like, I don't want that note in there. There's It rubs against this note. I don't want it to rub against that note. It's like, he heard it. Uh, and there's 10, it's like, two trumpets, two saxophones, three trombones, three drummers, you know, it's like he he hears Amazing. one note in that texture and can point it out. It's like so cool. like all right, I better <laughs> have <laughs> it's my so stuff cool, together. Though. It's cool. Yeah. Like, you know, it's just so much easier not to care, right? I mean, it's like right. it's just easier not to bring it up there, eh, whatever, right? And I want to play music. I know you I know you're like this too because I've experienced playing with you. We want to play music with people that give a shit about it. Yeah. That care about it. Yeah. I, I did a gig. I did a gig a long time ago. Uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't the best gig, not a ton of prep. And there was someone that said to me like, oh man, after the gig, somebody, and I'm not going to name, but a great player said to me, man, isn't it kind of fun to just have a gig where nothing really matters? And I was like, no, no, <laughs> like actually, no, like I'll never do this again. It was like yeah. a dueling, it was like a dueling pianos gig. And I took it during COVID because I was hard up for gigs. You know, I was like, okay, yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, and, 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 you know, nice guys, all, all good, good players, but just no prep, no, you know, like, yep. and yep. just calling stuff and kind of just, ah, whatever. It's just about the party. I don't want, no, that's not me. And I actually learned a lot about myself on that gig. I'm like, okay, I, I, I love a party, but it can't be about the party. Yeah. It has, the party has to be the result of killing music, dude. Oh. And then if that incites a party, excellent. But I don't want it to be about the party and then to have the music be sort of incidental. Right, you know? right. Like I want to play with people that are that really care. I feel that way about every genre. Even if I'm at a wedding, dude, and I'm playing Brown Eyed Girl, I want everybody to care about yeah. Brown Eyed Girl. And it's hard after yeah. a few uh -huh. hundred times of Brown Eyed Girl to sure. care about it. But I really, I really want that. I want to play with people that take it seriously, that are playing for the song, as you say, yeah. um, and that like that mentality is shared in the band. Because when that starts to go south, I'm out, dude. I'm yeah. out. I want to be with people that care. Honestly, man, there's so much of that in the jazz community. So much of not being prepared, maybe having a rehearsal, always looking at music. I mean, there's like there's this element of like whatever, whatever. I, I don't know what it is, man. I've been saying for years that one of the reasons why jazz fell off is because jazz musicians stopped taking the performance seriously. It stopped. It became this like, let's have a little quick rehearsal on stage. Let's let's talk and make jokes to each other and not talk to the audience. Let's there's this, you know, there's this weird element mm. to that music um that I'm a part of in a you know, in a lot of ways, um, that are disenchanting to me. That that I yes. that I feel like it's kind of they've shot themselves in the foot. Um starting you know, way back, like in the eighties there were you know, I remember these old cats. I was talking to these old cats, and they were like, "You guys are still making a hundred bucks a night on, you know, a hundred bucks a person on uh, on a Thursday night." He's like, "That's what we made in the '80s. We were playing restaurant gigs, background music restaurant gigs." And I was like, "Man, you guys are the ones that killed the music. You just played <laughs> background music gigs. You didn't care what you were playing. You weren't trying to put on a show. You were reading tunes from the real book. It's like, yeah, that's what killed the music. It's like people stopped putting on a show, you know. And the Dude, bands I, that, you know, I of course." That. So the ones that the the bands that are separated from those bands obviously are the ones that rise to prominence, and I think that's a big difference maker. Is like, hey, how how much do you care about the music? You know, yes. how much do you care about the show? 
I love that you mentioned that thing about charts too, because, you know, obviously we all in our day, we all have some level of relationship with charts, yeah. whether we love them, hate them, use them, don't use them, how, when we can get off them. Um, but yeah, all the stuff that I do, I try. I mean, with Nookie, it was really hard to get off charts for me, man, because it was, I mean, it was such difficult music to play. All the, the parts were so... Uh, you know, on oh, on the third time we do this set of hits and, you know, like all yep. very orchestrated. Totally. But like I have so much more fun and I recommend this to my students too all the time is like as fast as you can get off the book, get off the book. Yep. As soon as you can put those charts away or even maybe don't make them in the first place. If you have a bit of time to devote, you're going to do this thing a lot. Now, I understand if you're coming in and it's a sub situation, you're going to do one gig, of course, right? But like, even then, yeah. man, being memorized makes your impact so much better. If you can memorize and you can come in and be heads up in the gig, yep. oh, it's just, it's so fun. And and really, like, we work hours and hours and hours to be on stage for 45 minutes. Why not make that 45 minutes the reward? Yeah, That's the definitely. reward. So we're still going to be freaking reading charts during yeah. during the spot where we're supposed to be performing? No. Yeah. Man, so I mean I I I feel that, man. I I try. I don't always succeed, but I my my goal is to always be here. Yeah. And off of not not here, you know. Yeah, we were talking about Kevin Gastonway. He just we, I had him on the podcast and he just said a similar thing about the first time he played with the combo, he was like, it was a sub gig, you know, it was like one time sub gig. And he goes, I memorized 50 tunes, Damn. multiple keyboards. It's like, I put in so many hours for that one sub gig. Now he's the keyboard player for the mom's Dr. Mom's combo. That, I mean, it's like, he didn't know it. at the time that that would get him the gig, but ultimately, that's, you know, so it's like he started subbing more and more and more. They ca kept calling him back because he knew the book, you know, that's exactly right. Yes. Uh, same thing for me, like with Eric Hutchinson, I got an opportunity to go out and play a couple of one-off gigs well, a couple of one-off gigs, but they were just like spot dates, like fly dates with him. Yep. And I was not the guy. I was not the guy. And that was made clear that this is a sub situation. Mm -hmm. So I could have, and oh, and you know, if you need charts or whatever, no problem. But I knew, I knew, or I had a feeling that if I did that thing really well, there was a possibility that I could become the guy. Yeah. Uh, Eric had an incredible bass player at the time named Andrew Peruzzi, but Peruzzi was also playing with Hanson, ah. that band Hanson. And I thought, wow. yo, man, those Hanson dudes are going to start playing more shows. I know it. Yep. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do this really well in case he gets that, that Hanson thing. I'm going to, I want me to be the next thought. I want like, oh, well, obviously it would be Ian. Obviously, yeah. He knows obviously. the book. He knew that yeah. he came in prepared. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And I try to do that with everything that I do. Um, I don't always succeed. There's some times where I, I probably bite off a little more than I can chew. But the things that, um, that I really especially want to be a part of, things that I really feel invested in, man, I want to show up and just not be thinking, oh, what happens in the bridge? Oh, that's a horrible feeling. What happens in the bridge? It's yep. a terrible feeling. Oh, <laughs> you know, I just, yeah. I, I want to know. Yeah. Yeah. So talk a little bit about uh, MDing for Eric. Um, you've, you've been doing that. You said about seven years. Uh, yeah. I, I just was checking out this new sing along thing that he's got going oh, on. Cool. It, se it seems so cool. Oh, uh, so Wayne, cool. Uh, Wayne Tucker playing trumpet yeah. and singing. I know yeah. Wayne, I met him in Minneapolis years and years ago. Oh. Um, very cool, Dude. man. Like what's, what's that experience like working for Eric and, and MDing? I mean, so when I, I should clarify, when I started in Eric's band, I mean, I was the sub and Elliot yep. Bloffus, who I know, you know, uh, or do you know Elliot? I don't. Oh, Elliot Bloffus is, uh, he grew up in Chanhassen, killer oh. multi-instrumentalist. He, he lives out in Nashville, blonde dreads. Um, he was a killing. I mean, I came in, he was the lead guitar player and like lead keys. He had like keys for synth sounds. He had a Hammond, like a legit Hammond with a Leslie cool. and guitar and a killer singer, songwriter. He's one of those freaks that can do all the things. He's a great bass player. He's pretty mean on the drum set. Yeah. Right. So I came in under his leadership and he really ran that band in an amazing way. I mean, we did daily vocal rehearsals. I mean, it was wow. on the road. I mean, he'd be like vocal wow. rehearsal, you know, before the show. I mean, it was incredible. So, but he really had a particular style of leading that band that was very different than when he exited the band. Eric asked if I would lead the band. And I said, I, I can't be Elliot because I'm not all of those things. Mm -hmm. I'm going to focus more on space, on grooves, on parts. Elliot had brought the band into a big sort of show space where we were adding a bunch of hits. There was a lot of 
not trickery, that's a cheap word, but a lot of like orchestration to the arrangements. Mm -hmm. And we stripped the band down and I told Eric, I want this to be more about like, I'd like to take it back to some record stuff, especially since we don't have this big band. Um, and, And so, you know, I think I was good at doing that. Uh, but Elliot taught me so much, man. I mean, Elliot taught me to the value of like being good at a lot of things. Like he really good. Like Elliot would take a blazing guitar solo mm-hmm. at the front of the stage and then run back, turn the volume off on his telly, flip it behind his back, grab a Hammond part and sing like a, like a middle harmony, like <laughs> freaky, yeah. freaky. And so, you know, we've been doing this fun stuff with Eric where we've gone out as a trio and then I'm taking like Eric is a very functional guitar player and piano player, but he's not like a that's never been his first focus. So he's not taking solos on guitar, taking solos on piano. He can a little bit, but it's not his focus. He's a singer, he's yeah. a killing singer and songwriter. And so he was like, do you want to just take like all of the solo moments on the bass? And I was like, uh, <laughs> but you know, Elliot, man, Elliot set this precedent in the band. So I'm kicking on fuzzes and running to the front of the stage and taking big solos. And, it, nice. and it's, it's so much fun. But, um, I think you asked about the MD thing. And, and yeah. what I want to say about that is that, uh, my style of leadership in a band is really about putting the trust and the faith in the team if I've if I have suggested the players or I've helped cultivate the set list, the show, the players um, and put a team together, I don't have to say anything. I'm such a fan of let's play it and see what happens. Not on a gig, but in a rehearsal. Yeah. I don't talk about forms. I don't talk about what you should do, what you should do. Make sure that you're, I'm not a taskmaster. I say at the beginning, this team is here for a reason. We're all producers. I like to hire producers. Mm -hmm. Like I want everyone in the band to be a producer and to have a strong sense of voice, but also be playing for the tune. There's only a handful of people that are that, right? But I like to hire those people. Totally. And then I say to them, I believe, I believe you. I believe that what you are going to play is going to be great. And Mm -hmm. if it's not, I, everybody needs to own. I said, and if something's not happening, we're going to know it. And we're going to all probably agree that it's not happening and we're going to fix it together. But I am all about self-correction. I will never stop a rehearsal and go, oh, I will never point out a mistake. I used to. Like yeah. as a kid in my rock band, I'd be like, oh, dude. Oh, wait, uh. But that's just ego. <laughs> you know, that's just ego. Like pointing out somebody's mistake unless they make it five times in a row and they just actually don't know that they're making it. Yeah. Aren't but hearing someone, it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Not hearing it. That's the right way to say it. Yeah. Like for me, I'm never going to point out something to belittle somebody. It's actually very different than the old Prince guard, than the like negative reinforcement vibes that exist in Minneapolis. There's definitely yeah. like with Michael's leadership and with like Corey Wong's leadership. And I love those guys. I love them. And I've been under their leadership a lot, yep. but there's this thing of like ribbing and, and I think it does get results. It for sure gets results. It's just not my vibe. Yeah. I'm, I am not going to say it um, unless, unless I hear it twice. And then mm-hmm. I might say, hey, let's make sure is everybody on the same page. But I'm never going to single somebody out and be like, uh oh, <laughs> like, yeah. I hate that stuff. Actually, I yeah. think it's just like it's like it's uh, it's eighth grade and we're not eighth graders anymore. Yeah. So, I'm way into, I believe in this. And sometimes, dude, I think that you've got to play something a couple times and let people find it. Yeah. There's not always time to do that. But if there's time, I'm a big fan of getting done with something and just saying, I think we're, I think we're close. I think we're close. I think we just need to run it again. Yeah. Um, And that comes back to like trusting the people you hired, right? Definitely. we Dude. found the people that are going to be able to hear the stuff and are yes. going to on the second pass or it's going to be better. Yes. I yeah. just MD'd a, a day in the studio, a live band thing with the Potash twins. And, you yeah. know, you know, those two and they came in, they're doing all kinds of stuff, right? I mean, they're, they're flying around doing food stuff and they're, you know, and they're like, their heads are in a million places and they started immediately to like wonder about specific elements of the band. And I was just like, Guys, let's just let's just 
play it one more time. Everybody's yeah. getting their feet wet. It was KG on keys, the great Zach Miller on drums, my friend Joe Byer playing guitar. And I was like, we are going to find it. It's going to be would, fine. Yeah. Yeah. And we would get done. Yeah, those guys are a trip too. I actually taught uh, the trumpet at McNally. Yeah. He was oh, my student for a it. year. Hilariously. Oh, dude. I yeah, love he's it. A great guy. That was, it was a great guy. So, yeah. Oh yeah, man. I mean, and, and it turned out great, but they, they were like, they wanted to talk about details immediately. And my thing I kept saying it that day is after we play, we'll know more. Yeah. That's my mantra, dude. I don't want to talk about it. Don't say we do the intro and then we do the verse and then we do the pre-chorus and then we do like so many band leaders do that. Like, okay, remember on this one, we do the intro and then it kicks into verse and verse is going to go 16 bars. Uh, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, play it you're going to have context in the moment mm -hmm. when you're playing that. If you go into the chorus early, oh, that will actually tell you more that the verse is 16, not eight, than me telling you that before we're actually playing. Yeah, because you're going to feel it. In yes, the moment. dude. We, yeah. After we play, we will know more. That's how That's how I like to lead. Yeah, that's cool. That's interesting. I, I'm, I, like, I work with students a lot at the university level and my students are like engineering majors and i'm teaching them brass band music by ear so we do a lot of like all right guys let's review it's intro yeah. it's <laughs> so yeah, like yeah, calling yeah. me out right now man. Yeah, i'm like yeah, yeah. oh i should let them play oh uh, no 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 well but i mean you know i mean i guess i'm talking about musicians that i'm hiring that are pros yeah, totally, you know totally. it's different I, for sure but yeah but i do think it is interesting like i wonder what your results would be if you were like let's just play yeah, because what I've found is I started doing this because I didn't like people talking forms at me because I knew the forms. And when people would say, OK, remember, it's this and this and this. I was just like, this is a huge waste of time Yeah, because yep. because you don't think your brain can't even get it. Like if someone's like, oh, yeah, I remember the bridge does this thing. And I'm like, I don't even. I need to be in the song. I think maybe I learn differently, or something. <laughs> you know, like I, I have a hard time like hearing the bridge versus being in the song and being like, oh, of course. Yeah. Here, here comes the bridge. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So totally. I, I don't know. I wonder if it's just like, let's, let's just play it and see what happens. And then yeah. we'll talk. Then if we need to talk for him, we'll talk for him. Right. Right. Yeah. I like that. Hey, I want to get in a little bit to, of, to your content creation. You've done an incredible job growing your Instagram. Your Instagram has like 33 some thousand followers now. And I love the way that you, make content i was actually just looking at one of your videos and i was like man i gotta formulate my videos this way where you're like <laughs> you like dude, react that, to the thing oh, for a second you're sweet. like oh and then you go into it and you do it you know oh yeah the dizzy um, rascal baseline yeah, yeah. That's, so that's i want i want to know um you know when did you decide to start making regular content on socials and what kind of opportunities have you seen arise from that growth i know you said scott base lessons i'd love to talk about that a little bit too Dude, it's, it's been huge for me, actually. I uh, Okay, so I'm 43 now. When I turned 43 years ago, I had a midlife crisis. Uh, or I have a friend who says it's actually an awakening, which I love that. Yeah, more. man. But it was this thing of, uh, briefly, the whole, like, teens all the way, or I, I should say 20 to 30, I was in a rock band. And it was Tunnel Vision that. And then that kind of took a backseat. It kind of ended. And then 30 to 40, side man. Side musician. <laughs> completely i'm gonna take every gig i'm gonna do all the things i'm just gonna eat it all up and then when i got through that decade i had this feeling of i want a combination i missed the creativity i missed some of the uh intimacy of being in a band and creating in a band mm. that you don't get when you're a side musician but then there's all kinds of benefits of being a side man where you know it's not you on the hook you're playing with a bunch of different people you're getting paid instead of spending money in your yeah. original band right yeah. <laughs> and so i thought what i what i decided was i don't know that i want to be a solo artist i don't want to make like slap bass records yeah um but what i did want to do is take take like take something seriously that was my own that I could call my own. And I just started to do Instagram and I was like, I, I wonder if I really lean into this. So it was yeah. actually pre pandemic that I was like, I need to just take this seriously and try to start posting every day or every other day, posting a lot of stories. And I had, I just started to listen to some people online at the time that were really influential to me around doubling down on who you are. Hmm. Um, instead of this idea, we all have this thing. I think when we're growing up of like, be cool. Like you gotta be cool, <laughs> be cool. So if the thing that you like isn't cool, don't tell people about that. 
Like hide that, <laughs> hide that deep, bury that shit deep. Yeah, I, I and, know that feeling, man. You know, yeah, right. And the things that you actually like, it's actually very hard to be forthright to to really embrace the things that you actually really truly love, mm. and and put them. Um, Scott from SBL says you make the bug a feature. So the any of the thing, the things that you feel vulnerable vulnerable about the things that you feel shame about in your playing or who you are or how you grew up or what music you like or whatever if you can figure out a way to make that a feature hmm. so instead you do this you push it out and that's that's voice that's yeah. actually your shit um jonathan Marin, who's a bass player friend of mine who plays in the groove collective in new york says the thing that you're vulnerable about in your playing is your voice that is you and you have to actually figure out. So then it's a process of figuring out how to show it wow. in a way that you actually love. And so I'll, I'll give you case in point for me. What it was, was I love playing all these synthesizer sounds on the electric bass. And for the longest time I disparaged it. I'd be like, ah, it's kind of dumb in sessions. I wouldn't bust it out. Or mm -hmm. if I did, I would be like, oh, like really, um, Oh, what's the word? I would be, I would be sort of dismissive of it. I'd say like, oh, I can try this, but then you might want to replace it with a real keyboard. But you know, <laughs> and and then when when my friend Jonathan was talking about this, I I thought that's what it is for me. It's yeah. like using sounds um, and really leaning into the stuff. And I grew up loving like '80s hair metal and loving like hip hop and loving electronic music. But then when I was maybe trying to play a little bit of jazz. I wasn't talking about that stuff. Or maybe when I was, you know, trying to get into the cool, like indie rock band, I wasn't talking about how much I actually really loved hysteria by Def Leppard. I think it's a masterpiece because that's not cool. Yeah. I was pretending that I liked the Beatles. I was pretending that I loved Radiohead. Right. You know? And I, I came to that stuff way later. It's like a oh. joke, dude. So I really decided on Instagram to make, to try to be me in the best, the best, most authentic way that I could be, be a nerd. Like I, for, for the longest time I hid like loving gear and bass stuff. And because, oh, it's not cool to like gear. You're supposed to be all about the playing, the tone is in your hands. <laughs> but, and, and it is, and it is, you know, but also I really love design and I love gear and I love the products and the people that make them that have dedicated their lives to that. So I wanted a place that I could talk about that stuff and let the chips fall where they may, dude. Yes. And I will say um, it created a ton of opportunity, a ton of opportunity. Wow. Because when people see that you're being you, then then what happens is you're not going to get every gig. So you got to let go. You got to let go of wanting every gig. You're mm. not going to get every gig. You know, JT Bates, you know, JT, the drummer yeah, yeah. said to me like, man, like when I started doing, he's like, man, you're doing a lot of stuff on social. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, are you ever afraid that like you will be seen as like uncool by certain camps and you won't get certain gigs? And I said, yeah, yeah. I mean, I spent my whole life thinking that until I turned 40. Yes. Yeah. That was my whole thing. We're all scared. Dude, yeah. it's always high school. We're like, yeah. uh oh, what if I talk about the thing or play the thing and someone thinks that's corny, I might not get that gig. That is the thing that you have to drop. Yeah. Yeah. And when yeah. you drop it, you suddenly get appealing to way more like, so, so whatever, if like, if like the dudes in Bon Iver aren't down with me being a bass nerd and, and disclosing my love for winger good <laughs> because it's going to open up so many other doors. It's right. all good. Like you have to be you. Yeah. It's freedom. It's it, really, that's, that's the freedom. Yeah. That's, that's so fascinating to me. I, I feel the same way. I've, I've had all these feelings, you know, I've started to be a lot more active on YouTube and social media in the last couple of years. And I was already active on social media. Like I was already pretty outspoken, but yeah. I'm doing a lot more like videos and like silly yes. things. And I'm seeing a lot more and like yes. constantly going like, what are my, what are the jazz people I like going to think if right. I sing and, pl and write pop music and play guitar and like, but that's like me, I've been playing guitar since I was eight, you know, mm. and I've been writing songs since high school. And it's like, that I, I I'm going through this process myself of like getting out of my head and going, yeah, I'm just going to do the things that I love. And I'm in a position now too, where I don't have to, like before I had to take every single gig to make it, you know, just yes. to, just to get by financially. 
And now it's like I have the job at the university where I'm teaching students and it's like I can really focus on oh, that's great. my art and building social presence and building, you know, we're, we have Gig Boss's app that we're building that we've, this company that we're building as well. So this is another part of it is like Incredible. being being an entrepreneur and being a yeah. tech person. It's like, that's all relatively new. And that's a part of my identity. That's real. My dad was an entrepreneur. My wife's dad was an entrepreneur. It's like, it's in my blood. Yep. But also, what are they going to think if I do oh, this? Oh, I know, I know. Not just it's practice high jazz solos, you know? Yes. And man, bringing it to the trumpet, I actually, so when I first met Wayne, uh, and you mentioned Wayne Tucker, who I, I played with on that, uh, this sing-along record with Eric Hutchinson that we just did, which was a yeah. crazy fun experience. He's a beautiful cat, But man. when I first met Wayne, we were doing the Today Show, and Wayne came on, Wayne had never played with us before, and Wayne came on, and we were just jamming this tune, and it was like a really diatonic, it was an E major, right? So we're jamming this thing, and Wayne's playing along, and we stop, and he sort of shakes his head, and because we, Wayne sounds so good. Wayne has such a great sound and he just brings such a great vibe and and he stopped and he kind of shook his head I'm like dude it's killing are you cool like how are you feeling and he's like ah he's like it's just funny man he's like over the years like sometimes when I play he's like I've tried to be like bebop guy for so long and I'm like yeah and he's like but sometimes like when I play and I'm not thinking it just kind of comes out sounding smooth yeah and I'm like I'm like oh yeah and he's like yeah man he's like whenever I play it just sort of sounds kind of smooth and like and I think it's okay. He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of discovering that, like, maybe, maybe that's okay. I've been yep. trying to hide it, you know. And that was another man. I mean, I, I think about that moment all the time. And when I saw him recently in New York, when we made that sing along record, I was like, Do you remember this? And he was like, What did I? And I was like, Yes. I was like, Dude, I think about it all the time because it was like it was a glimpse into somebody, like being, being comfortable in their skin. Yeah. You know, and that's powerful. Yeah, like man. when you see somebody who's comfortable in their skin and they just do their thing and that thing might not even be right for you, but like, you know, like I'm probably not going to get a ton of opportunities to play with Wayne because we travel in completely different circles and the Eric Hutchinson is the Venn diagram, you know, that's where we yeah. overlap. But like, I see his content and I think it's awesome because yeah. he's doing his thing and, you know, and he sees my stuff and, you know, and I think, you know, he's supportive, right? So so it's about finding that thing and being okay, just being okay to like bring yourself to the situation. As long as you're self-aware, as long as you know you're not trying to play your thing and superimpose like your thing over the tune. You got to play for the song and but you know, like what you yeah. like, it's all good. Yeah, man. I'm curious about if there's any particular structure that you use when you create content for say like Scott's bass lessons. Is there a certain storytelling path that you're after when you do content for that when i got hired by sbl it was in the pandemic and he was like what can you help me with youtube i said i'd love to and he said what do you want to do and i said my my content model is has been this i want to do the things that i want wished that the players that i loved were doing so so I started to do for SBL, I would do like album breakdown. So I broke down like a, a Chili Peppers record, a Rage record, a Rush record. Um, I broke down Paul Simon, uh, Graceland by Paul Simon, like all records that I absolutely love. I did Continuum by John Mayer. And so what I want, I want to watch Sean Hurley break down Born and Raised by Mayer. Uh, yeah. I want to watch Justin Meldell Johnson break down Sea Change by Beck. Like I, but they don't, dude. I want to watch Bakiti Kumalo break down Graceland by Paul Simon, but he doesn't. Yep. So I was like, what if I just do? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> what, what if I, I do that? You know? And so then I took that. Then the idea for me was, um, I, I even want to see like session players that are playing on things that I don't even know. I would love to see their process. The big session cats, like I would love to see, like Sean Hurley in LA, yeah. I would love to see him talk about something he played on, that, n not even John Mayer, anything that he played on. So I decided I can do that. I play on a bunch of stuff. No one knows these artists globally. I Means maybe maybe in Minneapolis or the Midwest. And yep. but like I played on I I played on this record. I'd love to talk about it and break it down. And maybe maybe people find 
that interesting. So I really tried not to get hung up. I've got a lot of self-doubt and imposter syndrome. So I really tried not to get hung up on, oh, well, then I'm kind of being the voice of authority and like, oh, is this even yeah. any good? And like, ah, maybe people don't even know this record or maybe they're not going to think it's cool or... Dude, I just think it's about perspective. That's all I want. I want to say, here's what I do. And then like, you can like it or not like it. It's fine. Yep. But by saying, here's what I do, what has happened is it's given people maybe permission to do the same thing. Like there are a lot of bass players that tag me and stuff and they're like, oh, you know, here's what I'm doing, <laughs> you know? And like, oh, thanks for Ian for like, you know, giving me, you know, the inspiration or whatever. Like yeah. I just, my content model is, if I want to see it, if I wished Pino were making it, I'll make it. Cool. Cool. I love that's that. That's what I try man. to do. That's great. Yeah, that's what I try to do. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So I'm going to link your stuff in the show notes. So if anybody that's listening and wants to check out Ian, we'll link his Instagram and uh, we'll link Scott's Bass Lessons because he's teaching there. Uh, is there anything else? What do you have going on right now? What do you have coming up? Is there anything that we should know about? Oh, man. I mean, there's a bunch of records and stuff coming up. Uh but in terms of I play I play in a trio called the Orange Goodness that yeah. I'm really excited about. That's so fun. That's my little like sort of almost like funk rock improv space. I love it very much. Um, I'm working on some of my own music. So stay tuned for that. I mean, I think that my community, like if you want to check me out, my community is most active on Instagram. Do a lot of stuff for SBL and there's a bunch of really fun stuff coming up with Scott's Bass Lessons. But if you if if this has been intriguing to anybody at all and they want to check more uh, out, I, I'm at Instagram, um, Ian Martin Allison. And I just, I didn't do that to be an asshole to make you say three names. I did it because Ian Allison was so taken. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, there you go. Maybe you sound uh, and, cool though now. Ian uh, Martin yeah, Allison. Man. Yeah, yeah. I, I will say, like, uh, something that I think is really important about social is being able to um, interact. So I try to respond to every DM. I try to respond to every comment. I try to treat it like an on-street interaction. If someone came up and said, hey, man, I dig that thing you're doing, I wouldn't turn around and walk the other direction. Right. And I think so many people do that on social. And so I don't, I, I really do engage. If you have questions, if anybody, you know, wants to ask about nerdy based stuff, I'm, I'm there for you always. Awesome, man. Yeah. Well, thanks for doing this. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time. This was super awesome. I really appreciate it. Dude. Thanks for having me, man. It's great to see you. Yeah. Likewise. For sure. Yeah. I'm going to call you sometime. I got some tracks I'm working on. I'd love to have you play some bass Dude, on. Let's go. Let's go. I would love to. I, it's my favorite thing in the world. Tracking is my favorite thing ever. So I'd love to. Cool, man. We'll make it happen. Right on. All right. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Ian Allison. If you're still listening, thank you so much for checking out the podcast. Please uh, hit like, hit subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And go ahead and leave us a five-star review. Uh, and leave a little if you could actually type out a review on Apple Podcasts that really helps us out that that makes our podcast show up in other people's feeds so we need that as well appreciate you listening go down to the description you can click the link to check out Ari's Take Academy at your gig boss as your code you can also download the gig boss app at a link there you can join our Facebook group we have a Facebook group where we're just kind of Iron sharpens iron, you know. We're trying to help each other out, learn about the music industry, learn about the music business. Join our community there on Facebook groups. It's the Gig Boss Podcast group. The link is in the description. You're the best. 